continue with his lectures, please. Okay, um, <clears throat> this lecture is going to be a derivation of pair correlation theorem of Montgomery and, and some applications so you can see how it's actually used. So <clears throat> I believe John is going to talk about pair correlation on the random matrix side. Uh, are you going to derive the, f the formulas? So this is the uh, number theory side, the zeros side. <laughs> okay. So here's a statement of the theorem. <clears throat> and uh, this, this may look a little strange uh, right now, but it'll become more familiar as uh, we talk about it. So, <clears throat> by the way, can you see this? Uh, I, is, it, is it too hard to see? What if, if you move closer, maybe it's, what's that? Uh, they, they can't make it bigger. Yeah, I'm, unfortunately, I put it on A4 size paper instead of legal. And, uh, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so his theorem says, assume RH, let alpha be real, T at least two, and let F of alpha be one over N of T, so the number of zeros up to height T. Now, we're assuming RH, so this is, they're on the line. <clears throat> And then uh, you sum over all pairs of ordinates of zeros between zero and t. And you're summing a weight. So this four over four plus gamma minus gamma prime square. This is a totally unimportant weight function that just comes out of this uh, uh, way of deriving pair correlation, okay? You can prove this in a very general form with arbitrary weights, but uh, so, this is a way, think of it as W of gamma minus gamma prime, okay? Uh, the important part is that now we have T to the I alpha, alpha is our real variable, times gamma minus gamma prime, okay? That's where all the action is. Uh, this weight, though, one, one thing to observe is that if gamma is equal to gamma prime, the weight is one. And the other thing to notice is that the weight drops off quadratically um, as the separation of the, of the ordinates increases. So, uh, if you summing over gamma and gamma prime, that's really a, a cosine? Uh, yes, yes. Um, right, so, so uh, <clears throat> uh, the, f the first assertion about this is f of alpha is real, even, and non-negative, okay? Now, f is real. Uh, as, as David just uh, pointed out, if, if, you, if you interchange gamma and gamma prime, then this factor is the same, and here you get the conjugate, and so uh, the, the sum is real, okay? So that's th that part. It's even. Well, if I replace alpha by minus alpha, okay, again, you know, if you switch the gammas, you get uh, the same thing. Uh, so so uh, f, of alpha, f of minus alpha is f of alpha. Uh, f is non-negative is not uh, as obvious from here, but we'll see later if I can remember to point it out uh, why that's true. Okay, uh, here's the meat of the thing. f of alpha is this factor. Now this is a spike. When, when alpha gets, moves away from zero, so think of alpha as zero or positive because mine, you know, f of negative alpha, negative uh, numbers is the same as f of positive ones. Okay, so uh, if alpha is uh, zero, this is log t, and the other factors are smaller. So there's a spike at alpha equals zero. And then if alpha is uh, bigger than zero, then t to the minus two alpha is very small, log t divided by a small power of t. So this part is negligible, and alpha emerges as the main uh, 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 term. Okay, and this is valid uh, for absolute value of alpha less than or equal to one minus epsilon. Okay, Any, anything smaller than one. In fact, you can, we now know it holds uh, up to one, but uh, you need you know, just slightly more work to, to get that. 
Okay, so this is the theorem we're after, and then I'll show you how, how you derive information, some information about uh, zeros from this. <clears throat> okay. So let's start off with, uh, I'm gonna prove an explicit formula. I mentioned yesterday there's lots of explicit formulas, and uh, I, I didn't prove the, ex the explicit formula that, uh, um, uh, you know, sort of appears in Riemann's paper yesterday, but it will follow from the one I'm going to show you now. Uh, so let's, let's see how this goes. <clears throat> so for sigma bigger than one, zeta of s is this Euler product. Take logarithms, you get this, and uh, then write the log as its Maclaurin series. So you have this. Now differentiate. Uh, so all of this is valid, uh, you know, the, the series is absolutely convergent uniformly and so on. <coughs> so uh, zeta prime over zeta, the logarithmic derivative of zeta, is uh, minus log p, then a k comes out and cancels that k, right, from p to the ks. <coughs> so you get this. And this you can write, remember the von Mengold function, this lambda of n, this is log p if n is p to the k and zero otherwise. <coughs> so <clears throat> if n is p to the k, I have a p to the ks here, and I have a log p here, and that's exactly what we see here in this term. Okay? So zeta prime over zeta, like zeta, has a Dirichlet series expansion, and it looks like this, and these uh, lambda n's are um, log p's. <coughs> okay. Uh, next step I need to show you, this is a, a common problem in complex variables. Any uh, graduate course in complex analysis, you'll probably do this problem. Uh, it may be written a little differently, oops, um, but <clears throat> it, it's simple enough. So if you integrate from minus infinity to infinity, let's say on the two line in the complex plane, one over two pi i, y to the s over s ds, then if y is bigger than one, you get one. If it's equal to one, you get a half. And if it's between zero and one, you get zero. Okay, now, <clears throat> so let's go through this. Here, here's the idea. If y is bigger than one, then in this contour, uh, in this integral, I'll, I'll pull the contour left to minus infinity. Now what that really means uh, when you do these things rigorously is you, <clears throat> You, you don't go from minus infinity to up to infinity. You go from, say, 2 minus it to 2 plus it. Then move the contour left. You, so you have this big rectangle. You estimate the, the integrand uh, along the sides of the rectangle. And then you show that as t goes to infinity and the left edge goes to minus infinity, that everything's, those things are going to zero. Okay. Uh, all right, so that's what that means. <clears throat> and uh, so if y is bigger than 1, then uh, things are going to be small on the contour if I pull it left, because y to the et, y to the sigma will be tiny, exponentially small. So <clears throat> I do that, and uh, the stuff on the other sides is small. So what you're left with is the sum of the residues of the integrand inside. But <clears throat> there's only one pole and that's at s equals zero, and the residue is just one. So that's why we get a one here. If y is between zero and one, then I pull the contour to the right, because then y to the sigma, you know, just put absolute values around the integrand, y to the sigma <coughs> uh, is, is going to go to zero quickly if, if uh, sigma is, goes to plus infinity. Okay, so you pull the contour to the right in this, in this case, and um, there's no residue inside. There's no poles to the right. That's, so um, the two here is, doesn't matter so much. It just has to be any number to the right of zero, bigger than zero. Okay? So uh, there's no residue, so you get zero. And then uh, when y is equal to one, you can just calculate, calculate this by hand. And uh, it's not absolutely convergent. What we mean here is a Cauchy principle value. Okay, so this is just a straightforward exercise. All right, so this is a formula for getting one if y is bigger than one, zero if y is less than one, and 
you know, then you have this middling case where there's a jump in the behavior. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, here's, we saw this formula for zeta prime over zeta. We just saw this integral transform. By the way, this kind of thing is called a, an inverse Mellon transform. Uh, it's really Mellin, but it's, uh, I say Mellon transform, okay. So these are the two things I just showed you. Okay, and now uh, here's how we prove the explicit formula. And this is actually how you start the proof of all explicit formulas uh, that I can think of. Uh, so you might have general functions in here. The thing that's special to this situation is uh, what I'm integrating zeta prime over zeta or an L function against, okay? In this case, it'll be x to the w over w. Okay, so <clears throat> here's what we do. We take a, a contour, uh, uh, we take an integral along the C line where C is, uh, I'll tell you what C is later, but uh, so this is the integrand, integral we start with. And I want S plus W to lie in the domain, the half plane of absolute convergence of zeta prime over zeta. In other words, I want sigma plus the real part of W, uh, which will be C. I'm integrating on the W, you know, the C line. So I want sigma plus C to be bigger than one. And then zeta prime over zeta is absolutely convergent there. So I can replace zeta prime over zeta by its Dirichlet series, which is up here, okay? So I put in a lambda n over n to the s plus w, okay? And I split that up, so the n to the w, I uh, keep in the integrand, and uh, you have this. And uh, by this formula, for the inverse Mellon transform of this expression, our y is x over n. So if uh, y is bigger than 1, in other words, if n is less than x, okay, I get 1 for this. So I get lambda n over n to the s. If n is um, bigger than x, so y is less than 1, I get 0 for this. So there's no terms. So this serves to cut off the, it, it basically is giving me a, a truncation of this series, the series for zeta prime over zeta, okay? Okay, and then just a, a couple of technical details. I, I want x bigger than one because I want, I want, you know, all I'm interested in here is uh, y's, x over n's, uh, bigger than zero. X is not going to be P to the K. I, I want to make that restriction. Why? Because if X is equal to a power of a prime, then when N is that power of a prime, I get one half here rather than either one or zero. So this is, uh, so, uh, and then uh, sigma plus C is so that I could put the, ap the absolutely convergent series in for zeta prime over zeta. Okay. So, on the one hand, I have uh, this expressed as a, a, a truncation of the series for zeta prime over zeta. And now, we evaluate this integral another way. Um, namely, pull the contour left. Okay, now, again, to actually do this rigorously, you want to chop off the integral and, you know, and then estimate things around the size, but we won't bother with that. So if you pull the contour left, then uh, what you get is the sum of the residues inside. So what are they? Zeta has a pole at 1, so zeta of s plus w has a pole at 1 minus s. The residue is negative 1, okay? So, the re so I get x to the 1 minus s over 1 minus s times a negative 1. And that's this term here. All right, moving further in. Now, at the zeros of the zeta function, um, rho, <clears throat> let's see. When, when s plus w is rho, so w is rho minus s, I get x to the rho minus s over rho minus s. So that's what you see here. And uh, the residue is, from zeta prime over zeta is plus 1. Remember the... Uh, uh, the, from the logarithmic derivative of an analytic function of a meromorphic function has uh, a residue uh, uh, 
plus one at zeros of the original function and negative one at uh, poles. Okay, now um, uh, there's a pole at w equals zero from this w, and you get zeta prime over zeta of s times x to the zero. So that's this term. And then this sum over n is uh, just the residues from the trivial zeros of zeta at negative two, negative four, well, so s plus w is negative two, negative four, and so on. Okay, so that's what you have here. Okay, and uh, we have to avoid s being a pole or zero of zeta in this, this formula. Okay, so simple complex analysis, and now uh, the integral has two expressions. One is a truncated Dirichlet series, another is this, uh, this thing. Equate the two, and we get an explicit formula. Okay, this was first proved by Landau, this particular form. So uh, I've rearranged the terms, the order of the terms. Uh, uh, well, not much actually here, but so this uh, truncated Dirichlet series is equal to minus zeta prime over zeta of s plus a term from the pole at one, trivial zeros, sorry, non-trivial zeros and trivial zeros. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I didn't have time to prove the explicit formula that, uh, uh, for psi of x yesterday, but actually we've just proved it uh, because it's a special case of this. If you take s equal to zero here, you get the sum lambda n, so that was psi of x, and uh, let's say that x is not a prime power, so I don't have to worry about lambda n times a half, you know, that, that stuff. So, uh, what do you get? You get minus zeta prime over zeta at zero. You get x, right? The main term in the prime number theorem. Uh, minus x to the row over rho. And then this stuff. Uh, this, if s is zero, you can easily see this is the series for minus a half log one minus x to the minus two. Okay? So there's proof of the explicit formula. Okay, so now, oop, take take this and just rewrite it in this way. So I'll take this term with the, over the non-trivial zeros to the left-hand side, put everything else on the right, and we have this expression. Okay. And I'll group together the zeta prime over zeta and this truncation of this series. So that's first term. Okay, so it's just, uh, some of these things look messy at first, but it's just basic algebra. Okay, uh, and the same thing goes for this slide. Don't, I hope you're not put off by, by this. It is what it is. This is exactly what you just saw on the last slide. Okay, now I just wanna write this with two different choices of S. Okay, so first, remember the rows, uh, now I'm assuming the Riemann hypothesis is true. Actually, the proof of the explicit formula that I just gave you, it, it doesn't depend on RH, okay, it's valid. Uh, without, but um, now uh, think of the rows as a half plus i gamma, and let's first make a choice of s as three halves plus i t, okay? Three halves plus i t. Okay, if you make the, that substitution, you get exactly this, okay? Now this term, if, if this makes your head swim, uh, you, you can just ignore this term in all of these slides because it, it plays absolutely no role, it's tiny. Right? If x is big, x to uh, negative powers is small. Um, okay, so uh, here, so this first term, if s is 3 halves plus i t, this can be represent, represented as an infinite series, minus the sum lambda n over n to the s. But here's the first part of that series with a plus sign, so those cancel, and I'm left here with the tail, okay? Here I get x over a half plus i t, one minus three halves minus i t. Okay, I put a minus out here. Okay, so, so far so good, I hope. And now uh, go back here and put in s equals minus a half plus i t. Okay, so remember x, this is x to the half plus i gamma, 
the x to the half comes out, x to the i gamma, the rho minus s gives me this expression down here. Um, this time, I, I can't put in the Dirichlet series for zeta prime over zeta at minus a half plus i t because it's not a valid expression of zeta prime over zeta there. We're outside of the uh, uh, half plane uh, of representation. So I just, I just separate it out. It's right here. This at a minus a half plus i t is here. This, uh, oops, this at minus a half plus i t is here. And then there's trivial zeros, which we don't need to think about. Okay, now, subtract this from this, and then on the other side, this stuff from this stuff. Okay, so on the left side, you get this. Okay, the, the one plus i t minus gamma and one minus i t minus gamma combine just simple algebra to give you something like this. On the right-hand side, this term um, is here, right? This is the same as that. Um, oh, sorry, remember, I, I'm subtracting this stuff from this. So that's why there's a plus sign here and a minus sign here. Subtract this while well, it's sitting right here. And uh, for the x here, this term, I subtract this term, combine them, and we get this. And then the junk from the trivial zeros. Okay, this is our, the explicit formula that uh, Montgomery starts with. So, so this is, here I've rewritten this, the thing the same way. Okay, but now uh, I just wanna do one more thing um, zeta prime over zeta minus a half plus i t. Zeta, zeta prime over zeta and uh, zeta itself are actually quite well behaved to the left of zero, okay? And uh, so we take advantage of that here and it turns out that zeta prime over zeta there is essentially minus log t. Okay, so very quick argument. Why should something like that be true? Take the functional equation why the functional equation? I'm interested in what's going on to the left of zero, or which is left of a half. From the functional equation, I can translate that to what's going on to the right of a half. Okay. So, um, zeta, zeta of s is chi of s zeta one minus s. Take the logarithmic derivative of that and you get this. Um, if, sig, if s is minus a half plus i t, this is zeta prime over zeta at three halves minus i t. But that's just big O of one. Zeta prime over zeta in the, uh, you know, far to the right of one is, uh, is big O of one. So that means I'm looking at this term, but this is a quotient of gamma factors and so on, and its expression is this, if you approximate the gamma factors. Okay, this is Stirling's formula. So chi of s looks like this. This big O term is differentiable, turns out. Uh, if you write this in terms of, uh, put in s as minus a half plus i t here, and then take the logarithmic derivative of the expression, you just get this. You can probably see it yourself just from what I've written. Well, this is just to be exactly right. If t, I'm going to use this formula when t is near zero. And, uh, Even though you derived it to t goes to zero. Yeah, I mean, so this, uh, you can show that chi is actually, so if t is below t zero, this chi is going to be big O of one you know, depending on the T0, but uh, yes. Okay, so um, putting that together, this is a restatement of what we just saw. We had a sum over x, over the ordinates, x to the i gamma, and then uh, times this factor, depending on T, is um, 
a sum, I, I'm AX of N, let me just, let me back up here. See, there's, there's two Dirichlet series here, and I want to combine them. So the AX of N is uh, taking care of these coefficients so that I can just unify the uh, two sums into one. Okay, so that's, that's all this is. This was uh, from the pole of the zeta function at one. This was the term from minus zeta, from zeta prime over zeta at minus a half plus i t. And this is the junk from the trivial zeros, estimated. Okay, so this is, this is really the starting point of, uh, uh, for Montgomery. And now, how do you prove Montgomery's theorem? The basic idea is compute a mean square of this with respect to t. It's got to be the mean square of the right-hand side. Now, why would you arrive at something like that? Well, he was interested in understanding differences between zeros, uh, distribution of uh, differences in zeros. If you take a mean square, if you just take the mean square of uh, this side, you'll get, uh, so by that I mean, you know, mean modulus square. So you get x to the i gamma times x to the minus i gamma prime and a double sum over those, okay? So that suggests that, you, you know, maybe you can, you, you're going to get some information about those differences. Okay, so uh, we'll call this side with the zeros L and the side over here with the Dirichlet series as the uh, most important term. Uh, R, okay, so this explicit form is L equals R, and you prove Montgomery's theorem by computing the mean square of both sides and setting them equal, okay? So that's, that's all it is. So let's see how that calculation goes. It's not really too bad. Again, there's more symbols than, than stuff here, okay? So uh, uh, please don't be put off by this. Uh, the, so the integral of the left-hand side, this is just the left-hand side mod square written out. There was a root x on the previous page, now there's an x, okay? So we have this. Okay, now first sum, if you're really serious about this, this is a good exercise. <clears throat> Using n of t is t over 2 pi log t. <clears throat> um, you can show that if you truncate this sum over all the ordinates, to uh, truncate it up to t. So go f throw away all gammas that are below zero and above capital T. <clears throat> uh, then what you lose is a big O of log cube t. Okay, so um, now at the same time, you can, you can then take this integral from zero to t. So, so I've, I've truncated the sum over gammas here in the next line. Uh, in a similar way, you can show that the integral from zero to t can be extended to, from minus infinity to infinity. So you approximate the two tails that you've added. And again, you need this you know, information on the density of the zeros. <clears throat> And uh, you again lose a big old log cube times, well, it's, it's a little more complicated, but uh, so the, the basic point is that I can change this to an infinite integral and a finite sum at the cost of an error term like this. The x is coming from x times the log cube. Okay, so now square out and integrate this thing, okay. So it's simply this, okay, and uh, and then this integral is just this is a this is a, a basic residue calculus uh, problem. Uh, you just do it, and you get this weight that we had: the four over four plus gamma minus gamma prime square. Okay, so. Um, We'll call this sum uh, 2 pi x f of x t. So f of x t is this double sum over ordinates of this factor. Okay, and then there's an error term, and here's your exercise. Uh, for, uh, this this is the value of the uh, integral. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks, Brian. Yes, this is where I need to say. Uh, you can see from, this is definitely positive, 
But this is 2 pi x times this business, which was essentially what was in the Montgomery theorem. So this is non-negative. Okay. Okay. So that's the other point in the in the theorem done. <clears throat> Okay, so we've computed the left-hand side and we have an expression involving f of x t, which is the thing we're interested in with the zeros. Now we have to compute the right-hand side. Okay, this is just what the right-hand side was, that Dirichlet series term from the pole at one, and so on. Okay, we want the mean square of this from zero to t. Okay. Well, first we'll calculate the mean square of each of the pieces. Okay. So the mean square of this Dirichlet series, we use Montgomery and Vaughan's mean value theorem. This is just a restatement of it. And you put in what the coefficients are. These ANs are general coefficients. Our coefficient is lambda n a sub x. That was just the funny weight of lambda on lambda n. So we have this. Uh, so the, you just write out the mean square, like if, you know, you remember this changes its form when n is less than x or uh, bigger than x. So I've split the series into two pieces. And, you know, you get lambda squares in both of them. Um, and then uh, the n over x and the x cube over n cube come from a, n, a sub x of n squared. That's all there is to that. Okay, you can compute, uh, uh, if you know the prime number theorem, you don't, so uh, you, can, you can compute things like this. The prime, remember, psi of x is some lambda n. Well, by partial summation, you can do things like uh, lambda n times n, lambda n over n squared, things like that. And uh, you can do lambda squares, too, in a reasonable way. Okay, so by the prime number theorem, we can uh, evaluate this. Uh, we get a, a, a main term and some error terms. Okay, so the mean square of that is taken care of. Now we need the mean square of this. Well, you can see that's going to be an x square times 4, and then the integral of, you know, mean square of that denominator. Uh, so um, I've written that. So, oh, it's, I'm skipping some terms. Here, so it, that's written here. We don't actually need it exactly. Um, you can just see this is uh, big O of x squared. The trivial term, uh, mean square of that, is even more trivial. Okay. Uh, so that leaves the mean square of this guy here. So there's a 1 over, so that's here. So there's a 1 over x, and then you're integrating essentially log square t. So that's going to be a t log square plus a big O of t log t. Okay, so now I know the means, I, I'm interested in the mean square of R. I know the mean squares of the pieces comprising R. And then, then the idea is simply, if I, if I know for certain ranges of x relative to capital T that one or the other term dominates, is the largest, then, um, that will be the size of the whole thing, mean square, right? In that range. Okay, so uh, if you if you look at this, <coughs> the, uh, this term and this term you can completely ignore. Okay, x is going to be bigger than or equal to one, and uh, you know if x gets big, this is a problem. But okay, so focus on these two. You see, if x is close to one then this is like a t log square, and this is like a t. So this will be the dominant term if x is near 1. That's the spike term we saw in Montgomery's theorem. We're going to think of x as t to the alpha, and then you get t over uh, t to the alpha here. Um, okay. So if x is close to 1, uh, this is a, the spike term. If x gets bigger, then this is the dominant term. If x is, say, t to the alpha, this is a, a t to the 1 plus alpha times alpha log t. Okay. So specifically, here's, 
here's how this sorts out. If x is between 1 and log t to the 3 quarters, then this is equal to this, and this is the dominant term out of the, you know, all those mean squares. Okay. Uh, if x is bigger than log t to the 3 halves and goes up to little o of t, so notice there's a gap. This, this is log t to the 3 fourths. This is starting at log t to the 3 halves. But uh, apart from that gap, from the rest, for the rest of the range, the mean square here is this, and that's the dominant term. In the intermediate range that I've left out, it turns out that both of these are little o of x t log t. So we'll just throw that in as an error term. Okay, so putting that together, the mean square of the right-hand side of our explicit formula is this. Okay? And the left-hand side was 2 pi x times that double sum over ordinates. So putting it both together, we get f of x t is this expression. <clears throat> okay, so um, here I've written the same thing out again. Now set x equal to t to the alpha. So alpha bigger than 0 corresponds to x bigger than 1. Okay, and then uh, write, when you do that, uh, divide this by the number of zeros, t over 2 pi log t, and call that f of alpha. Okay, so when you do that, you, uh, you get Montgomery's theorem. So uh, let's take a look. When x is t to the alpha, we're going to get an alpha from this, t over 2 pi log t. But the t over 2 pi log t is divided out here for f of alpha. Um, so that's this term. And then um, here, uh, I got a t to the 1 minus 2 alpha log squared t, but I'm dividing out by a t log t, so I get this. This, this is the spike. And that proves Montgomery's theorem. <clears throat> okay. Um, any questions? Okay, so let's see how you use this. Uh, what time did I start? 20 minutes, okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so here's how you can use the theorem. Uh, Suppose you have a nice enough function so you can compute a Fourier transform. So R is a function, and uh, its Fourier transform I'll define like this. And then the inverse transform I want to exist too, so it'll be this. Okay, so now <clears throat> I take a general R that uh, has a Fourier transform that's invertible, and uh, <clears throat> I look at this expression. So this is my f of alpha, and then uh, that, that normalizing factor for the number of zeros that I divided by, I'll throw that back in. So that's, that's why that's here. Okay, now put in what f of alpha is. Uh, it's the sum. This w is that weight function, 4 over 4 plus gamma minus gamma prime square. Okay, so that's an abbreviation t to the i alpha gamma minus gamma prime, r hat of alpha. Okay, now do this term by term, so interchange the sum and integral, and we get this. So I've written the t to the i alpha business as e to the 2 pi i alpha gamma minus gamma prime log t over 2 pi. Now notice this log, log t over 2 pi, um, <coughs> I'm multiplying the average spacing between zeros, you know, consecutive zeros is, is 2 pi over log t, if the gammas are near t. So uh, this is the, this is like the uh, uh, thing uh, John Keating was talking about earlier, where you normalize so the average spacing is 1. Um, this, you can think of this as normalized. So these expressions, gamma minus gamma prime, you know, the mean distance between consecutive zeros would be 1 uh, when you do this. 
Okay, so you have this, and this is, so just formally, now this is just the uh, inverse transform of our hat, so we get this. Okay, so the point is that if you ever have a, an expression, some test function that you want to evaluate at differences of the ordinates, then you can do it by integrating the transform of the test function against f. And we have an expression for f, that's Montgomery's theorem, okay? Spike, and then this alpha term, and so that's, this is how you use the thing. Uh, but remember, the theorem is for alpha between minus one and one. So the test functions that you integrate f against have to be supported in that kind of interval, okay? And this is a big limitation to, to the whole thing. <clears throat> Okay, so here's an example. Um, let's take a, a Fayer type <coughs> um, object uh, as R. Its transform looks like this. Lambda is just a parameter that we'll choose in a little bit. Okay, then uh, if I use the uh, formula on the previous page, the sum R uh, over these terms is this, so f integrated against r hat. Okay, so now <clears throat> um, uh, r uh, is this, so this sum is equal to this. Just simple substitution, okay. Uh, on the other side, I have to take f and multiply by r hat. This is r hat. So I'm integrating f against that function. It's a triangle function. <clears throat> so you do that, and this is obviously, uh, you know, first semester or well, second semester calculus in the states. Um, and this is the result. Now um, we need r hat if we're going to integrate this. Notice wh where we're integrating f here. It's from zero to lambda. Okay. And f, uh, we only have this expression for f up to 1. So we want to take lambda to be slightly less than 1, okay? So you do that and, um, well, okay. So uh, let's now consider this sum over pairs of uh, ordinates and uh, where the ordinates are equal. Let me just... Hold on a second. Okay. <clears throat> okay, let me skip to here. If I look at this sum over ordinates where the ordinates are equal, then that's bounded by this expression. Why is that? Well, remember um, this W factor, if gamma equals gamma prime, which is what I have here, this is one. Okay, so that's fine. What if gamma equals gamma prime here? Well, you know, in the limit, this is one. So these terms are included here, and all other terms that might occur are non-negative. So this inequality is valid. Now, let's go back up here. <clears throat> this sum over pairs of ordinates can be rewritten as a sum over the multiplicities of the zeros row. Rho is a half plus i gamma summed for ordinates up to t. Why is this? This is a double sum, and for each zero, a half, you know, that's a half plus i gamma, I want to count uh, gamma prime as many times as it occurs as a, as a zero, namely the multiplicity. Okay? So that's why this is true. It's a straightforward. Okay, and now this we just calculated on the previous page. It came out like this. We take lambda as close to one as we can and then write down the formula and we get that this sum, double sum with gamma is equal to gamma prime is less than or equal to four thirds, right? One plus a third, t over two pi log t. Okay, but this sum we can write like this as a sum just over gammas, and now this is the inequality we have.
Okay, so now you can see this is telling us things about simple zeros or multiple zeros. <clears throat> if there were lots and lots of double zeros, let's say all the zeros were double, exactly, then m, would, m of rho would be 2 each time, right, for each zero. And then I'd have twice n of t on the left. But I have four-thirds n, n of t on the right. So this is placing a limitation on, on the number of uh, multiple zeros. Okay, to be more precise, um, <clears throat> if we want to count simple zeros, you notice that the sum over all the simple zeros is bigger than or equal to this sum. Why? Suppose I'm at a simple zero, then m rho for that zero is one. So this term is two minus one, which is one. Suppose that the zero is multiple, like a double zero. Then I'm counting zero here. Suppose it's triple, then I'm counting negative one. So this right-hand side is certainly less than or equal to the sum over the simple zeros. Okay, but uh, this is splitting this up. This is twice the number of zeros, t over two pi log t, minus the sum m of rho. We just saw that the sum m of rho is no bigger than four-thirds n of t. So two minus four-thirds gives two-thirds, and we get Montgomery's result that on RH, at least two-thirds of the zeros are simple. Okay, then um, this I, I mentioned, the, the, you know, so uh, what we know now because of uh, uh, Hungbui and uh, Heath Brown is that on RH, actually, instead of two-thirds, we have a little over 70 percent. Okay. How much time do I have now? Oh, that was fast. Okay, so we're almost done. Let me uh, tell you Montgomery's conjecture now. This is extremely important. <clears throat> uh, we proved Montgomery's theorem by starting with this, this explicit formula, computing the mean square of both sides. Okay, now the limitation we got this limitation on alpha that it couldn't be bigger than one, and that is a, a big problem. <clears throat> Where did that limitation come from? It came from computing the mean square of this Dirichlet type series. Okay, we use the classical mean value theorem or a Montgomery Vaughan mean value theorem, which just takes into account um, uh, the uh, diagonal terms when you square out. Okay, I showed you that earlier in, the, in my first lecture today. And uh, remember I told you then that uh, if, if, uh, if the length of a Dirichlet polynomial is little o of t, then you can hope for a, an asymptotic formula for the mean square. But if, it's, if, if the uh, length gets bigger than t, then uh, you know, all bets are off. And that's, that's what's going on here. That's the effect we're experiencing. Um, and uh, the alpha less than one is giving us a place where that, that's the regime in which we can uh, compute the mean square using just diagonal elements. If you want to go beyond t, so alpha is bigger than one, <coughs> then uh, when you compute the mean square, the off diagonal terms that you have to integrate in when you square out are no longer secondary. They contribute to the main term, they genuinely do. And if you want to control them, uh, then what you uh, need is uh, some information about twin primes. Expressions like this, lambda n, lambda n plus h. These are the kind of coefficients, rather than lambda square of n, that come up in the off-diagonal terms. Okay? Uh, what Montgomery did was he assumed the Hardy-Littlewood conjectures on twin primes with a good error term. And uh, you won't find this in his paper, uh, but he worked this out in some fashion <coughs> and um, took into account what he thought the off-diagonal terms should be, and that gave him uh, an expression for f of alpha that was essentially 1 for all alpha bigger than 1. Okay, so uh, the picture of f of alpha
is <clears throat> up to one, we have this, here's one, f of alpha is alpha, and then Montgomery conjectures that it's one from then on. Uh, this is, you know, there's little old ones here, but, uh, and then it's even, so it looks the same over here. And then there was a spike at the, at alpha equals zero. Okay, so this is Montgomery's conjecture, that alpha, f of alpha looks like that. Montgomery's theorem is that on RH, uh, the part from minus one to one is correct. Okay, now, um, <clears throat> we got information about simple zeros by uh, using this, you know, an R hat and integrating against F. And we had to restrict, because we only know F between minus one and one, R, R hat, or whatever I called it, uh, is between minus one and one. Well, if you know Montgomery's conjecture, you no, no longer have to restrict uh, your R or R hat from minus one to one, uh, you can take fairly arbitrary ones. And uh, so doing that, if you, if you, um, if you uh, sum R of gamma prime minus gamma log T over two pi, and you, and you take as R characteristic function of an interval from say alpha, um, zero to beta, okay, so then this is one side of that formula I showed you before, then um, you can compute the right-hand side like this. See, but you need bigger support. If you use a characteristic function, the support of the transform is uh, big. <coughs> okay, and, and, oops, and then you arrive at, at uh, this Montgomery's pair correlation conjecture. Okay. Um, also, if you're allowed to take a bigger uh, support, then in the argument where I showed you that there two-thirds of the zeros are simple, um, you can take lambda to be big now if you have Montgomery's conjecture. And if you do that, then you show that 100% of the zeros are simple. So Montgomery's conjecture implies that 100% of the zeros are, are simple zeros. Um, so so <clears throat> the twin prime conjecture alone actually won't prove it. If you have the twin prime conjecture with a really good error term, square root error term, then you can get the support here out to alpha equals two, just short of two. What Montgomery does is he also then assumes that the error, those square root error terms that you have uh, will cancel each other. There's, you have to sum a bunch of them. If they, so if they behave randomly, then uh, you get out beyond two. Okay, and I think I'll stop there. <clears throat>